Children was there. I think that was right before they were going to do the. The re. It was probably taken because they were about to re up. You know, redo the antenna for the haystack of, uh, antenna. So I think this is not recent, but for me, recent means it within the last seven or eight years. <laughs> Yes, though, if for the intro, better you be back. I will. I'm okay. putting my laptop down. Freezing. Well, we were expecting a pretty large contingent from, or at least I've heard a few people from uh, whichever uh, meteorology group in the area this year, but mm -hmm. probably the storm did that many. Okay. So, whenever my head gets chopped off, if I walk through the place, I might just say. Okay. Well, okay. Rezzy's here. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> did you watch the eclipse last night? I did not. I'm not, I'm not sure I could have seen it. Uh, well, it was visible. visible. What? It definitely it was visible. visible. You could see it. it was visible? Yeah. The, it was cloudy like till 9 p.m. and then it was quite clear. Uh, the eclipse was like midnight. So like, it's a yeah. uh, picture because the moon is so high. I have started. to say I was asleep at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> I was up early shoveling that, that day, so I'm kind of sore still. And even though I shoveled, my driveway is a sheet of ice. the penultimate talk in our series. Um, tonight, Dr. Anthea Koster is going to be talking about Space Weber. Um, Dr. Anthea Koster is an assistant director and uh, principal research and scientist at MIT's Haystack Observatory. She got her, re her PhD in um, 1983 from Rice in, er in um, ionospheric physics. Right. Yes, <laughs> ionospheric <laughs> physics. And, um, has served as Commission G Chair for US, URSI as a fellow for the Institute of Navigation. If that, please That's welcome pretty good. Dr. <laughs> Anthea Custer. So thank you everyone for coming out on such a cold night. I hope that I, when I was putting this talk together, I didn't know where, what level. So I think as this is MIT, it's probably too low. But if there are any questions, please ask. Uh, this is Haystack, and if you haven't been out there, we are part of MIT. We should, you're welcome to come visit us anytime. And in fact, you guys might want to arrange that as part of this club to, to have a tour of Haystack, because I think it's a pretty fascinating place. It is a, depending on the traffic, 45 minute drive to sometimes two hour drive to get there and back, but it, it is a really beautiful place. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about radio propagation just to recover uh, what Phil showed earlier and also to, to 
use the stuff that I will be using in the talk. And then I'm going to talk about space weather and I'm going to give some specific examples. Um, so why am I showing this? Well, my, a bit of my history actually is that I'm not a ham radio operator, but my father was Dutch and grew up in Holland. Uh, and during World War II, he was actually supposed to be working in Germany, so he was in hiding. And the radios had all been confiscated. Now remember, he's Dutch. And so what do you think they did? They bought parts on the black market, he put one together, and they powered it with a bicycle. And that is actually how he learned English, because he was listening to the BBC two or three times a day. So I, I, I'm very fond of radios, of just going back from, from this historical uh, time. So then, when I went to Rice, I actually got my PhD uh, at the Arecibo Observatory. It's actually similar to Millstone, but it's much larger. It's in Puerto Rico. My advisor was the founder. He's the tall man there. He's no longer alive. He was a great man, Dr. Gordon. And he's the one who came up with the theory of incoherent scatter and actually found the money and actually built Arecibo. So they have since named the antenna after him. It's the William E. Gordon antenna. And from there, uh, oh, but I want to admit that my PhD research was not, mainly not on the Arecibo Observatory. It was with this 50 megahertz radar, which was either on the island of St. Croix or the island of uh, Guadalupe. And this was in the days when we didn't have GPS, so timing was really difficult. We actually used the Skywave, if people know what that is to try and measure what the time was. And there were a lot of inaccuracies. Having GPS is so much better. Uh, the other thing was it was still when analog tape, so we had to do all the A to D conversion uh, back. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of analysis that now would be much, a lot more straightforward to accomplish. Um, so next slide. So. Yeah, so this, Phil used this, and I just want to show you where I am in this whole uh, IAP, IAP radio lecture series. I'm at the bottom, space weather. You can see me right there. But because it's associated with the medium, I really am going to cover some of what, uh, or recover some of what Phil was talking about in his propagation in the ionosphere talk. Um, and I, how many people in this room are hams? A few, okay. So uh, I'm not, as I said, so my expertise is more in GPS. It's more L-band frequencies. So I'm, I hope that uh, I, I do, if, I'm, if you see me missing something important, please raise your hand, correct me, or, or let me add. So space weather, and this is the, the definition from the National Space Weather Program Strategy Plan. It's defined as conditions on the sun and in the solar, wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere that can affect performance and reliability of space-based and ground-based technological systems. Now, really, a full uh, a course that covers all of this is probably going to be more than what I have time to go through. I've tried to capture the most important parts, but I've given a three-hour lecture on this before, so I'm just saying I'm probably going to skim over some important parts. Um, but most, not all, most space weather does start on the sun, and basically it starts when we have either a CME, this is a coronal mass ejection that actually explodes and a lot of energy is uh, emptied out and it is uh, carried by the solar wind, hits the magnetosphere and then it interacts with our ionosphere and that's when it starts, we start seeing problems. <clears throat> More immediately it will interact with the Earth's magnetic field. This basically just shows you the Earth is uh, very, very standard as a dipole. It's kind of offset from the North magnetic pole. One of the things that um, people are noticing is the magnetic pole is really drifting fast these days. And in fact, 
It used to be that, that at Millstone we were getting some of the polar, sometimes becoming an almost polar site when we had a large storm. That's not happening as much because the, the North Pole has moved. So even in the last 20 years, it's, it's moved considerably. And it's possible that it's going to leave Canada and go to Siberia. So a lot of things are happening pretty fast with our magnetic field. And no, we can't predict that. Not yet, anyway. Um, the other thing you might uh, hear in Boston occasionally see are aurora. Now, I had the opportunity, I didn't see this one, but uh, remember this slide because we're going to come back to it. This is in Venati, Alaska. I had some uh, experiments set up there, and uh, we were actually able to launch a rocket during one of these large explosive auroras. <coughs> And you'll see see what happened during that time, but um, pretty exciting. However, I'm not sure you're aware that when you have a very very large solar storm, you can see aurora in Colorado. You certainly can see them here. And during this storm, I saw it in Boston, in Westford, and I'm from Texas, so I'm going to also point out you can even occasionally see aurora in Texas if the storm is large enough. So, with that, uh, oh, and one last thing, if you go to this website, we have, they're kind of old, but I still think they're very informative. We have a series of podcasts that we did in collaboration between Haystack and Loch Ness, and basically it uh, was to introduce the science of space weather to the public and I recommend these for anybody who's interested and would like more. They're at the, the website there. They're also on YouTube, I think. So, so going back to radio propagation, I think I lifted this slide from uh, Phil, but as you know, radio waves are just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the early 20th century, we really didn't have the, the capability to do more than AM and then FM broadcasts. It's really been in the, since the 60s that we've started working more with the higher and higher frequencies, L-band, S-band, X-band. Um, but from here, most electromagnetic waves propagate in the uh, transverse uh, T mode, so basically your E field and your B field are perpendicular to the direction of the wave, and the waves are basically described by wavelength, amplitude, polarization, phase, and direction. Pro they propagate at the speed of light in a vacuum, and they can su be superimposed linearly, mostly true. Uh, I'd say that all of the physics, as everyone knows here, can be uh, described by Maxwell's equations and really if you're ever getting stuck, I would say go back there and then work out because everything starts with <coughs> Maxwell's equations. So, and the number one thing is most radio waves propagate through the ionosphere. Not all, but most. The ionosphere is basically the region of plasma that starts at around 100 kilometers, maybe a little bit lower, and extends up. I mean, there's definitely plasma all the way up, but the ionosphere is really somewhat bounded between 100 and 1,000 kilometers. But for me to say there's nothing above 1,000 is wrong. There's definitely still electrons and ions above there. What happens to these waves as they go through this medium with the magnetic field imposed is what uh, concerns us. So, as I said, some waves are reflected. Those are the lower frequency waves, and I'll show you that with the uh, Alpton Hartree equation. Some waves just get refracted, and the amount of refraction, again, depends on their frequencies. So, TV waves and FM waves go through. And really, by the time you get to the higher frequencies, X-band, S-band, they're pretty linear as they go through. There's some, some refraction, but not that much. The higher the frequency, the smaller the effect due to the ionosphere on the wave. Oops. Come on. <clears throat> so again, the two regions that we really get concerned with as uh, 
in propagation, the ionosphere, which I've mentioned, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the different layers. We're also concerned with the troposphere. Um, the troposphere you can think of has in it, embedded in it, besides all of the many particles and pressure, it also has water molecules, which are dipoles. So because of that, you are going to have some issues due to refraction in the troposphere and range delay. So we can't ignore that index of refraction. But aside from that, the troposphere is not dispersive. So everything that goes through the ionosphere, the different frequencies are affected differently. In the uh, troposphere, that's not true. So we don't, have, we don't have that dispersion relationship to tease things out. On the other hand, it's much easier to model what's happening in the troposphere. And the big variability is the amount of water vapor. So we can use one of the great things GPS is used for, which you may not be aware of, <coughs> is it can be used to estimate the total precipital water vapor. And that actually is now going into NOAA's um, models for how to best predict say how much water there's going to be due to a rainstorm, how much snow we're going to get, or how much water is in, in the hurricane. So the precipital water vapor information that's coming from GPS is an actually huge advantage uh, to uh, some of our models. But you don't get the advantage of the dispersive frequencies. Um, so back to the ionosphere, and I think if you didn't see this in Phil's talk, you saw something similar. Um, during the day, this top one is from uh, the International Reference Ionosphere, which is a standard model of the ionosphere. And basically, it's showing you the different regions. So from like 60 kilometers on up to 100, we have what's called the D region. That region is where most of the absorption of the radio wave happens, and it's only there during the day. It goes away quickly when the sun sets. The E region is uh, also there, and it tends to go away at night. It may not go away completely, but it, it definitely is much, much smaller. The F region, there tends to be, that's really where the maximum electrons are, and there tends to be both an F1 and an F2 region in the daytime, and they merge into a single region at night. It's there all the time. So you always have an F region. Sometimes you have an E region at night, not always, and the D region goes away. Uh, the D region is the one that's most, that, that's really an absorption uh, layer for radio waves. I'm trying to think what else is important. And it's these layers that control the different hopping for your ham radio waves. Now this is actually my expertise is in GPS and basically we download every GP scientific GPS receiver we can get and using as I said the uh, <clears throat> dispersive nature of the ionosphere it affects the two frequencies differently and scientific GPS receivers have two, now some of them have three frequencies so we can make these calculations of total electron content to all of the satellites in view by every receiver. And by combining them, you get these maps. And I'll just show you. I think this is a kind of disturbed day because you see right over South America, you see these two peaks. That's known as the Appleton anomaly. And where it's red, that's where we have the most ionosphere. And think again, if you were a ham radio and you're trying to propagate through this region, which goes high and then low and then high again, it's going to affect your propagation. So let me, I've lost my cursor. Where, oh, here it is. There. So it's going to, you're going to see it change. And I'm sorry, I don't, I know this is a disturbed day. I don't know how disturbed. It was the March 14th, 2016. But you can see the anomaly goes away. It's now nighttime. But want, I want you to notice all the gradients that you're seeing. Like, it gets super blue, and then in the Aurora region, you can kind of see it. Now you see this intensification during the daytime, which is almost uniform.
but as you look over the poles, you can see some variations and some sharp gradients. So this is just a standard day, but we, we take this every single day so you can look at it. And when we have a large magnetic storm, it can really affect what you're seeing with the TEC. So <clears throat> this is the equation, Appleton-Hartree equation, which I think Phil showed you, but if not, it governs uh, the propagation of radio waves through the ionosphere. This is the full-up equation, although I think I ignored collision, so really the full-up would have an additional <laughs> term. Usually we can ignore the collisions, and in fact, usually if you actually pl start plugging numbers in here, the, the term that's the most important is the X, which is the ratio of what's called the plasma frequency to your angular frequency of the wave. That's the dominant equation, uh, the, the term. And so by doing that, you can actually make the assumption that everything else goes away and you're left with simply uh, one over n equals one minus c plasma frequency divided by the angular frequency squared. And if you plug in all the numbers, what you get is approximately one minus a, where a is a constant, times the electron density divided by the frequency squared. If you work that out, what it's telling you is that if you were to actually send a wave to something like GPS, where you know exactly where it is, and you're bouncing it off, you're going to get a range delay that's equal to 40.3 divided, this is in MKS units, by the way, 40.3 divided, divided by F squared times the integral of the electrons along the line of sight. Okay, that is true. So, any time that we are measuring GPS with two frequencies, we're calculating the, ra the range difference between the two frequencies. By doing that, we can directly work out what the electron density is. <clears throat> Simple. And that's how we do it. So, again, just to review this, so what the ionosphere does, it both has refractive and dispersive uh, properties. Refraction, simply, if you look at that pencil, at the boundary between the water and the air, the pencil looks bent, or actually looks like it's in two pieces. If you think of the ionosphere uh, changing as a function of altitude, so that index of refraction is, is changing at each point, you get a curve, the, refra the bending, all right? And that's because it's changing at each point in time. Again, uh, due to dispersion, basically if you have a prism and you're shining sunlight through it, it breaks up all the frequencies into a rainbow of colors. That's exactly what's happening with um, radio waves in the ionosphere. Different frequencies are getting different effects. So that's why the range delay at one frequency is different than the range to, uh, delay at another. And by using that, again, we can calculate what is exactly happening in the ionosphere. <clears throat> so again, I've now put this into radar equations. I actually did a lot of satellite tracking, and this is the kind of information that they need to know. You have elevation refraction. That happens to both the troposphere and the ionosphere. And again, what it does is it allows you to see at elevation angles lower than, the, than what you think it is. In other words, in some places in the tropics, and this is really more to the troposphere than the ionosphere, you can track objects below the horizon. And that's because of the bending that's happening. So you can use it to your advantage. But if you really want to know what the elevation is, you have to correct for it. Um, the range delay is the same thing. Due to both the troposphere and the ionosphere, your true range is always less than what your observed range is. And that's simply because the wave is not traveling at the speed of light. It's traveling slower. And you have to count what that is. That is. <clears throat> and it's lar the largest for GPS, although Tom Herring doesn't always agree with me, but 
For GPS, the largest single error left is the ionosphere. Now, usually the ionosphere is pretty small, but when it acts up, it is the largest error for GPS. So, again, just to give you an idea of, of the size, uh, so here we have the range delay due to the ionosphere. So if we had TEC of 50, which actually nowadays is pretty uncommon at mid-latitudes because we're in solar minimum, but if you did, at S-band, it would be 2.4 meters. At L-band, it's 12 meters. U of H, it's 104 meters. And VHF, it's almost a kilometer. So that's the kind of differences we see due to the different frequencies. And just to again let you know, GPS works at L-band. <coughs> so we're looking at very, very small differences <coughs> when we make our measurements between the two frequencies. But nevertheless, because GPS is so accurate, we can turn around and make very, very accurate measurements of TEC. So this is just in summary of, ra of radio wave propagation. Um, again, the index of refraction with no B field is N squared equals one minus omega P. Again, that's the plasma frequency divided by omega squared. Again, if your um, the, the frequency of the, the, um, that you're actually propagating with is equal to omega p, then you have the index of refraction equal to zero, and what happens? The wave gets reflected. It's essentially what happens. So the plasma frequency is defined there. It's, it's a, um, a natural oscillation frequency in the plasma but it's equal to the number of electrons times the electronic charge squared divided by the mass of the electron times the permittivity uh, constant. So you can see it's just a, a natural oscillation uh, you know, within the plasma. All right, so now we're going to go into space weather. So I just mentioned earlier that we're in a solar cycle, but we're now into solar minimum, meaning even for you hams, not much is going to happen for the next few years. We're, we're on the descending cycle of cycle 24, and in fact, we think that solar minimum, we might have reached it, but it's probably at 2020. It's, it's definitely pretty low now. Um, now, that's not to say nothing's going to happen because some of the largest um, solar storms we've had have been on the descending cycle. However, uh, I think we've passed those. I think we're now heading to a very, very quiet time on the sun. The sun has these 11-year cycles, and uh, that's, that's what's happening right now. Now... Uh, again, this is just to show you that we can still have big storms in small cycles. Uh, this is all the historical cycles of the sun going back before 1800. This comes from NOAA. And there were two really huge storms. One was called the Carrington event, and it happened in the uh, 1860, 18, late 1800s. And if we had an, a, a storm like that today, because that was before our satellites, we're not really sure how bad it would be. It would, it would cause a lot of problems. Uh, they said that during that storm, people were able to read newspapers at night in New York, and that they saw Aurora all the way down uh, to, to the Caribbean, so Bermuda. So, that was a huge storm, and we haven't had anything like it. There was another really large storm in 1929 or 1930, I think. This, yeah, 1859 storm and 1921 are the exact dates. And um, the 1859 was the really large one. 1921 was still very, very significant. We haven't had anything like those since, but Notice they were both associated with these lower solar cycles, which is what we're getting into now. 
So what I'm saying is we may not be entirely out of the woods. Um, I'm showing you this just to get, I like this movie um, just because I'm kind of nerdy, but I like, I like it because it kind of gives you the scope of everything that's happening. This is uh, showing you, it's from the University of Michigan, it's showing you a flare and how it propagates to the Earth and the Earth's magnetosphere. And what I like is that it really, it does give you the scale because you think of, you don't ever think of how large the sun is and how large the effect is of the sun. But here, they're, they're having the model go out and now, it's going to start interacting with the Earth and the Earth's magnetosphere. And this is the part that I find amazing. There's the Earth <laughs> and the magnetosphere. So we're really a very, very smart, small part of the whole solar environment. And I think it's worth kind of reminding ourselves of that. Oh, where is it? Oh, that, that's the sun, or is that the earth there? This is the sun, where right? Is the earth? This is the sun. Well, you can't even see the earth. That, that earth was at the very end. If we go, if we show it again. So here, the storm is going through, right? Large, oh. large storm. And then what they're having to do is because the Earth, so the, the solar wind, that's the sun is the black spot. <clears throat> and now you've just got the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere is on one of these lines, but it's so small they have to magnify. They have to start to really magnify it so you can see it. And sorry, uh -huh. right in there, that circle, that's the Earth. And the Earth's magnetosphere is, are those lines, and they're being bent back by the solar wind. <clears throat> so there are three main agents of space weather, uh, although I'm going to kind of introduce some more at the end of my talk. The first one is there's the electromagnetic emission. So that actually takes eight minutes, that's it, eight minutes to reach the Earth. And it can cause a radio blackout. All right, so this can be serious, and I'm gonna show you some examples. We do have them every time we have a solar flare, a large one, you can see it in GPS TEC, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, the next one is charged particle radiation. That takes 10 minutes to several hours to reach the Earth. That's really a, what we would call a solar radiation storm. And that affects primarily our satellites and the, the radiation environment that our satellites it, is in. It also affects, and I don't have a lot of information about this, but I can point to you to where to get it, um, our, our astronauts and our um, flight crews, that are especially those that are going over the North Pole, they're affected by this radiation environment. And if it's large enough, like for any of our um, astronauts that are leaving our magnetosphere, it's gonna, it can be severe. So they need warnings of this, and they need places to go hide, sheltered areas where they're not gonna be affected. And there are some cases where if we're sending somebody to Mars and there's a really large storm, um, there may not be anything we can do. So I think people are not talking about this as much as they should. Um, that's my personal feeling. Then what I spend most of my life doing is looking at what's called the magnetized plasma. What happens when the ionosphere gets all of these structures and all of a sudden our GPS doesn't work? And that's really what's called a geomagnetic storm. And that takes, depending on how big the storm is, it takes three to four to five days to reach us. So I'm gonna probably talk more about the last one. I'm saying to everyone here, we should probably all, including me, be paying more attention to particle radiation. And I'm gonna show you some kind of fun examples of electromagnetic emission. So, solar flares. Basically, you have a violent er explosion in the sun's atmosphere and energy equivalent to 100 million hydrogen bombs is released. 
it, these uh, actually arrive, uh, that takes eight minutes from the sun, and the duration can be minutes to up to three hours. And it only affects, and this makes sense, the daylight side, lit side of the Earth. So <coughs> if you're getting a solar flare, only the daylight side's really going to be affected. And the impacts, it affects the GPS network, it affects your communications, your grounded space-based uh, com, and it affects your radars. So this is an example from Cornell. We had a graduate student there who's now works for MITRE, uh, Alex Rudy, and basically we're monitoring this, um, it's called a increased solar radiation bur burst where we get more power at L-band. So normally when you're looking to track GPS, you're looking at the signal to noise ratio. So what's happening here is the signal stayed the same, but the noise went up. And the noise goes up because of the solar radio burst. And what I want you to see, normally these solar radio bursts are not in L-band. This one was, oh, sorry, what happened? Wait, wait. We'll do this again. What I want you to see is look up all these green. I want you to start noticing how many turn red. Those are our high precision GPS network. And you'll notice every place they turned red, they weren't able to do their precise tracking. So they were affected pretty strongly. Now, people may say, well, why didn't we notice it? And let me ask, when you're driving your car and all of a sudden your GPS stops working, you don't necessarily, the first thing in your mind isn't, oh, it's a solar radio burst. It's more like what tunnel, you know, what is my, and that's most likely the normal excuse. We just happen to have the, the high rate precision network that we monitor, so we knew this. Now this is my own data, and I'm just gonna show you, it's not a big effect, but I'm gonna show you what happens when the solar flare hit. So this is the daylight side, and basically, you're gonna see it's blue, and all of a sudden, see where everything's red? We had a one to two TEC increase of, in the ionosphere immediately following a solar flare. And that happens pretty much every time. This is an example. We had a series of large solar flares in September 2017, and this basically shows you, um, I'm tracking all of the um, GPS receivers between the latitude of 50 and 52 and a longitude of 0 and 10, and you can see as soon as that solar uh, flare, we see a huge jump up and loss of lock because uh, they really shouldn't be going quite as high as up to 20, nor quite, quite this part here is probably um, loss of lock, but this part here is real. And again, here you can see it at another latitude location. Again, we see this huge increase, and that's due to the solar flare. So, now here's the solar radiation storms. As I said, I'm not as much an expert on this, but I think it's something we all need to consider. The arrival of this is 30 minutes to several hours, and the duration could be hours to days. Um, impacts, primarily satellite operations. You can have a range of problems from loss of data to loss of the satellite and I'll give you some examples. Uh, aviation, so you can have communications and exposure, as I said, human, the, the people who are actually flying over the poles are the most exposed, and, and there's something to be said for the higher cancer rates that we have uh, for our stewardesses. Um, high latitude HF comm outage, I think most ham people are aware of it, These, that's uh, due to here, and then manned sp space flight which I was saying. So basically the Earth's magnetic field protects us for the most part from these large bursts. It's only when you leave or if you're in there and you're in the trapped radiation environment here where a lot of our geostationary satellites are. So they're being exposed, these belts fill up 
and then they're exposed to higher radiation. And then over the poles, like if you're flying an aircraft, as I said, this is a more dangerous region during those times. Um, so the space environment effects at GEO, uh, basically you have the electron and ion particle effects, which are radiation. You have um, satellites internal and surface charging. You have magnetic field variability. So that means if you have something that's using a magnetic field to sort of position your satellite, it's going to have problems. I think they're moving away from that. That was the older satellites. Um, because your magnetic field is changing during these time periods. The space environment variability, particle energy, density, flux, composition, magnetic field strength, direction, this is all. And basically one of the problems is that the environment, the sort of radiation environment and satellite anomaly relationships are, exist but we really don't have a good, it's really poorly defined for any specific satellite. Historically, that's because the satellite owner operators haven't wanted to release this information to the public because they don't want, I mean, for them, it, it's a competitive disadvantage. So, but I'm gonna show you, I think in the next <coughs> slide, some of the, the anomalies you can get. So these anomalies can happen over minutes to hours to days, weeks, months, years. But basically, you can have surface charging. And that's dangerous because then you can have like a rapid discharge, which can affect your electronics. You can have internal charging, which again can also cause problems, but probably over a slower time period. Um, you have single event effects. And that can be due to cosmic rays or solar um, protons. And these are primarily the things you hear about, these single event upsets. You have what's called total ionizing dose. So that's over how long a period has the satellite um, been exposed to that. I have a personal, I'm diabetic, as I mentioned earlier, and I have a uh, insulin pump, and I had several fail me because I was exposed to too much radiation, and I work at Haystack, a large radar site. So I'm just saying, I know for a fact that electronics, if you see, if they're exposed to too much, can fail. Uh, I was beyond the average. I mean, I was having one fail every year, and they kept saying, it's where you work, it's where you work. So consequences, you can have discharges due to the surface charging, you can have arcing, you can have rapid uh, deposition of charge energy, accumulated dose effects, um, induced currents, and then in the system, so what, what is happening to the satellites, you can have bit flips, spurious sing singles, memory corruption, phantom commands, sensor background enhancement or loss of attitude control. That's actually, we've lost a couple of satellites in the geosynchronous belt, which we cannot control anymore, probably due to something like this. Physical damage to the satellite due to the, these discharges, uh, displacement damage in semiconductors, discolorization uh, coloration of optics, <coughs> discolorization and damage to thermal control surfaces. And I think this is just a list, it's kind of an old list of things that failed. Telstar 401, it, it appeared to have a massive electrical discharge several hours before it failed. And it failed, preceded by a factor of a thousand increased in electron fluence for 24 to 48 hours, total loss. Uh, ANIC E1, uh, it had a primary momentum wheel control system that failed or during high energy electron enhancement, loss of attitude for seven hours. It was attributed to internal surface charging. And then in 1996, malfunctioning power distribution unit caused loss of solar, uh, south solar array power, anomaly preceded by severe electron fluence variations. Again, it's attributed to internal surface charging, um, ANIC <coughs> E2, loss of, uh, so basically it, the primary momentum wheel controlled system failed, 
uh, during high energy electron enhancement. And it was recovered seven month, months later, but it's attributed to charging. Um, and they were saying the loss of revenue was 50 to $70 million. Goes 8 had an attitude control system. Experience, RAM experienced charging and bit flips that caused attitude control difficulty. And it had a similar anomaly, which resulted in one day removal of GOZES from, surface, from service. And these are just examples. Um, this is an example of an optical sensor difficulty during a, a radiation event where obviously um, it wasn't working. So space weather basically is, it causes many annoying, but again, a few very severely damaging satellite anomalies. All right, so back to geomagnetic storms, which as I said is the area I'm probably the most involved with. Basically, these storms arrive tw 20 to 90 hours, <coughs> two to, two to uh, five days from when the CME leaves the sun. Uh, the duration is hours to days, really, and they create ionospheric storms. And their impacts are on satellite operations, aircraft operations, actually um, <coughs> that goes beyond also inland waterway uh, navigation is affected, power grid operations, GNSS operations, pipelines. Yeah, what is GNSS? Uh, sorry, it's another word for GPS, but it includes all of the systems. It stands for Global Navigation Satellite System, but it includes things like uh, EGNOS and GLONASS. I mean, we are no longer the only game in town, so the official name is now GNSS, not GPS. So <coughs> this is really where I got involved was there was a really large solar flare on Bastille Day, June 14th. Uh, July 14th in the year 2000. It was the biggest solar storm in nine years. And at that time I was involved, I was uh, doing satellite tracking at Lincoln Laboratory. And we, we actually used GPS to monitor our ionospheric correction for our radar. And I noticed during this storm that something funny happened. We basically could not track our this is TEC. We couldn't track TEC for four hours during the storm. And right during the peak of the storm, I got no data. Now, I always got data from my system, so I had, but I didn't save everything, so I couldn't go back and try and figure out what was happening. I just knew that my system was down. So I went to talk to the people where I now work at Millstone, said, what was happening? And they said, well, there was this huge solar storm and oh, by the way, we were measuring these really, really high electric fields right over Millstone. Like right over us, they were measuring um, the local westward ion velocity, which correspond, it doesn't move unless there's an electric field. So when you see this large increase in the ion velocity, it means that there's a large increase in electric fields directly overhead. So. Obviously, to me, that meant something was going on over Millstone. And so I started uh, plotting all the TE disturbances for sites near us. And what you can see is during that four hours where I wasn't able to track, only one receiver here, and that was the one in Portland, Maine, tracked. All the others, westward, the, the, one, the two on our site, and then one in Canada and Ottawa, they could not track. So, and other than that, I couldn't see anything really unusual happening except that I'm not able to track during that time period. And then I was also operating a radar in Florida. And what you need to know is that prior to that four hour time period, the TEC between all of these sites was matching pretty closely. And then all of a sudden, right when I'm not seeing anything, they're measuring something that's huge. It's like 140 TEC. And in fact, I showed this to one of the other ionospheric people, um, experts at the time. He said, well, that's not real. You did something wrong. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm like going through the data, going through the data. No, it was right. 
Um, and so we actually, that, that's when we started making these maps. Back in the year 2000, there were not that many GPS receivers. There were only a few hundred. But we took all of the ones we could and we started, we showed that there was this, this uh, it's called SED plume structure. You'll see that the intensity and there's, there's boundaries on either side. Now we kind of knew that was going to happen and this is a different, completely different kind of map, but this was done with incoherent scatter radar and they, they knew that we could possibly see this kind of structure. Um, but nobody had ever seen it in a single snapshot over the whole continental U.S. And then once I showed this again, nobody believed it. I had to then repeat it for a number of storms. And what you're seeing is that anytime we have a very, very large geomagnetic storm, we have these structures coming up over the U.S., over the eastern coast of the, the U.S. It does depend when the storm starts. And I should also say that since this time, we've seen these structures over Europe and certainly over South America. So they exist globally. It's sort of a local time, what time you see them. But they are largest, I think, over the US. And that has to do with the dip of the geomagnetic field. This is also just to show you an example. This was two GPS receivers. One is Key West, one is Guiana. And again, right at 2000 UT, you see this huge difference. Guiana go, just drops down. It's really in the equator. And so basically what's happening here is all of the equatorial plasma is just going to zero. And then Key West is just being completely lifted up. So very, very dramatic. And later on, uh, John Foster, who works with who's retired now but worked at Haystack, basically he made the connection. This is with the image satellite, which was actually flying over um, the, the, the about four or five Earth radii looking down at the plasma. Basically, he was, they're seeing that the plasma sphere before the storm is quite extended. After the storm, it's very, very reduced and you get this tail this, they call it a plasma spheric plume. And it turns, if you actually do the mapping between the plasma spheric plume and the, this plume that we're seeing in the, the ionosphere, they map one to one. And so we're basically seeing the footprint of this plasma spheric plume in the TEC data with the ground base. So it's pretty neat. Just to show you, here, here's our movie of the TEC. And you can see we have this plume start to form and then it basically goes away. So does that mean those particles are also kicked out of the atmosphere? Or Wait, so can you repeat? So does that mean that's also knocking particles out of the atmosphere? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and I think at least in the lower inner magnetosphere, it is. What's actually happening to the TEC? Um, again, we're measuring just the ground base, but yeah, I think s the answer is I think some of it does. Some of the ionospheric electrons occasionally go up and actually enter the ring current, and then some of that plasma is released. Where does it go to? Does it go to the outer magnetosphere and come back in? Possibly. Our measurements only go so far, so it may just be a, a large redistribution process, but it seems to be real. Uh, and the other big thing that, that I would say you guys all care about is when they first, there's something called the wide area augmentation system, which all of our aircraft use to land airplanes. And when they first, they actually first initiated was in 2003. Now I had been presenting these papers at Institute of Navigation uh, conferences prior to 2003, but I don't think anybody paid me to pay too much attention. But all of a sudden in 2003, they just started was and they had a series of really, really large storms. Some of the largest storms we've had in the past decade. And those storm 
actually the one here caused several hours of outages. I mean, it didn't cause any plane crashes because they knew something was wrong in the ionosphere and they just told all the pilots, you can't use WAS. But they basically said you can't use WAS all over the US for almost a full day. And they did that on two or three of the storms that were happening. So, and the, ha the storms happened really fast and it was during this test period. So everybody was kind of alarmed. And the reason you can't use WAS during that time is just to show you, if you were trying to land a plane in Pittsburgh, the, the ionospheric correction, remember it's that, that uh, term I was showing you, because of the changes in the TEC, it went from 32 meters to less than five meters in 10 minutes. And that could have easily, I mean, they need to know their altitude to within five meters. So this is a huge problem. In Washington, D.C., you can see it went from 25 meters to five meters, back up to 15 meters, back down. So the FAA was aware, but it could have caused problems if they hadn't been paying attention. And this is just, again, another of the movies. This is one of my famous movies where you can see right over the US. So now separately or related to this, so we have the large ionospheric gradients that are associated with these storms. We also have what's called phase scintillation. And I haven't talked about scintillation yet, but scintillation is something where when you're tracking and all of a sudden your amplitude or your phase goes wacky, and that's exactly what happens when we have these large gradients or structures. I've circled them over here. Um, so you can see right on the edge of that plume, you're seeing all those large circles. That means we were having trouble keeping track of phase, where there's a large phase variation. The other thing I have shown at the bottom is that most people only think about airplanes, but as I said, inland waterways, they need to know their heart. If you've got a large barge and you're trying to take it up or down and all of a sudden you don't know where it is horizontally to within five meters, you're in trouble. And that was happening too due to these large storms. So it's not just um, airplanes. So scintillation, I think the simplest way to look at it is if you think of your ionosphere, Remember, it's the electrons and it's the, the protons, but really for radio wave, we really care about the electrons. We got this magnetic field. You got irregularities in the plasma, and basically the incident wave is very clean as it's coming down. But the wave front where it hits the plasma is uniform phase, uniform amplitude. When it goes through here though, and when it comes out on the other side, all of a sudden you've lost your phase and your amplitude is either non-uniform or quasi-uniform. And when you basically track it on the ground, it doesn't look anything like you want it to look. Now, who cares about this? Um, well, a lot of people in South America care about it. And Rosie here is really much more of an expert uh, than I do, but every night, uh, in the equatorial or many nights you have these plumes form and on the edges of the plumes they have irregularities. What I'm showing you in this plot here is just some of the amplitude scintillation of a single satellite crossing through one of these plumes. And what, why do we care? Well, the people who care in Brazil, believe it or not, they're planting agriculture 24 hours a day. They know, and they have it now, it's a science. They know exactly where each seed is supposed to go and how much fertilizer is supposed to go. And if they're relying on GPS, they can't, they can't get the type of accuracy they need to, to do the seeding. They also have the same problems in Brazil for the offshore oil rigs. They need really high precision. Um, and again, they can't do it when they have this kind of effect. Um, we also have this problem in Alaska or in the polar latitudes due to aurora. 
and due to other very dramatic things that happened there. I'm going to show you some examples of simulation we saw with this event. And uh, basically, this was one of the more fun trips I got to go on. I went to Venati, Alaska. I'm not sure if you know where that is. It's about 250 kilometers north of Poker Flat. Um, Poker Flat is near Fairbanks, Alaska. Now, this was, I uh, believe it was a lot colder than here. Uh, right now, and I got to go there for this rocket campaign that was run. Uh, the Chris, Christina Lynch from Dartmouth was the PI, and this is a shot of the uh, rocket actually going out. And she had it such that the rocket, they were going to launch it during an aurora, which they did, and it was to sort of the apogee was over Venati, which is why we were. Um, basically putting as much equipment in as we could in Venati. But uh, a realistic reason of why, why this is actually important is we actually launched the rocket in an aurora on March 2nd, not March 1st, 2017. And somebody came to my friend uh, in Calgary and said, we had a problem right around 6 UT on March 2nd. Um, they're doing mining, and uh, this is one of the vehicles that they're using, sorry, in um, right at, at the mining company right outside Calgary. This is the largest autonomous vehicle in the world at this time, and, and basically they were not able to track. Uh, they had to turn it off because something was going on. And, Turned out this is an aurora, and all of these satellites that they were using to track, uh, the ones in red, were seeing very, very large scintillation, and she couldn't track. So she did some analysis. Remember, it happened right at uh, 6 o'clock, and you can see the positioning error went from less than a centimeter or almost to a meter for this period of time. And again, Positioning and timing are related in GPS. They had the same kind of timing error right at that time. So they had to turn off, and they didn't quite know why, all of their uh, autonomous vehicles because of this event. And now I'm going back. I'm just showing you some of the stuff that I got to do when I was flying up to put my G GNSS receiver uh, in Venati. There's the plane. Uh, this is the view from the plane. These are my housemates in the cabin. The cabin uh, was pretty warm, but the, uh, there was only an outhouse. It was minus 47 Fahrenheit there. That's the coldest I've ever been. It wasn't bad, but you put your cord out to your receiver. You could not, you could not step on it because it would crack. When you pulled it in to the building, you couldn't touch it. You had to wait for it to thaw out. You couldn't, couldn't touch it because it was so cold. And there we are. But this is basically our GPS. You can see my antenna was mounted in a way that uh, you really could hardly see it with the ice. And I thought, this is the world's worst antenna mounting I've ever seen. Turned out it was able to track 17 satellites almost immediately. So it was okay, it was good enough. That's maybe the way I should say, it was good enough. But here, we're actually measuring scintillation. This is an auroral arc. I've over, overlaid our scintillation data onto the auroral arc. And everywhere where it's green or it's small, it means we weren't measuring scintillation. And what I want you to see, everywhere where it's getting large, that's where we saw scintillation. It's right where that arc is. So the day before, this, this big event here happened the day before. And what was really significant here was not just the scintillation, but the increase. This, the scintillation is shown here. So we definitely saw increased scintillation. But we also saw this huge jump in total electron content. So normally, you might see one or two TEC. This, we saw 10 TEC units, bang, right? And it, that lasted for quite some time. I think I'm going to skip some of this. 
But basically, you can see here, we're seeing scintillation as, as these auroral arcs are coming through. But what I want to focus on is not only did we see this 10 TC increase in Venati, we also saw it in poker. <clears throat> and what we're seeing is that in poker, we saw it that increase first. So we saw it first that increase in, in, in Southern, and then we saw it more. And by looking at the differences, we're able to calculate the speed of about 450 uh, meters per second, which corresponds to uh, uh, an auroral arc. But as I showed you for this event, this is a space weather event because we've, we have actually tied this to the problems they were having with mining operations in Canada. So it was affecting users of GNSSS during this time period. So I'm going to give you some other examples that I just think are fun, but I don't know if I would call them space weather. One is the eclipse. I don't know how many people, the solar eclipse, not the, <laughs> the solar eclipse. A lot of hand people were uh, involved with that, and I'm not really talking about that. I'm just going to show you some of our GPS data. And because it's so cold right now, I'll show you a little bit of our stratospheric warming. Uh, connections between the ionosphere and stratospheric warming. And that is maybe related to why it's so cold right now, because we had a pretty in, uh, large stratospheric warming earlier this year. So here's the solar uh, eclipse from August <coughs> 2017. And we basically were very active at Millstone. This is our incoherent scatter radar which I think Phil talked about, yes? Yeah, I, I also had a, the, the one under design also, I know a bit more about because I was actually working at DTI, but Phil touched on it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, they, we did a lot, we did a lot of stuff. The so <coughs> scatter was, was tracking. This is actually before the eclipse and you can see uh, the, the radar is scanning north to south, and you can see right here um, we see a pretty strong ionosphere, which is what we would expect. During the eclipse, it basically goes away. And this right here, this hole, that's really in the direction of the eclipse itself. Um, this is another way of displaying the same data. I actually really like this. This is from a non-eclipse day, so this is how, this is uni time, universal time in hours, and this is altitude, and this is basically normal, uh, what we would expect. And during the eclipse day, first off, we saw a lot of, I would call them TIDs, and this is before the eclipse, and I, I think we need to, I don't think these are necessarily associated with the eclipse, but it's awful strange that we saw so many. Um, but here's the, the ionospheric hole. And then one of the things we saw that was a little surprising is that this increase in TEC happened much faster. So I, we did, a, but we were analyzing our GPS uh, receivers, but we also had a number of receivers that we put directly on the line of sight of the, the, the maximum of totality. So we had one in Oregon. This one is in Wyoming, and I'm going to show you. This is very sad what happened here, but I think it might affect. Uh, people should be aware of what happened. We had a, a bunch in uh, Kansas, and then we had some in uh, South in North South Carolina. So, and these are all our people who helped us. Several of Tom Clark, I think, is one of the big hams that may, may many people know. He had one in South Carolina for us, and Greg Earl, I think, and Magda Moses. They're all hams. Uh, this was our our setup that we basically we borrowed the receivers and we we sent this out to all our our participants. I, of course, was in Montreal. I didn't get to see it. But this is my favorite uh, helper. He's Dolores Knipp's 90-year-old uh, father. He's a farmer out in uh, uh, Kansas, and he basically was saying he didn't need a GPS receiver to do his farming, but he was pretty happy to have it here. Um, and most of our data look great. You can see our GPS 
it, basically what you're seeing is that all of the this noise is because we're mapping the different line of sights to uh, directly above, but you can clearly see the hole in all of them. This is Missouri and this is South Carolina. Really beautiful. And notice in Missouri and South Carolina, you see a, a lot of these very, very small uh, wiggles, I would call them, and those are TIDs. And we had one of our scientists published some interesting results that uh, are probably real. Um, but the maximum change we saw in the TEC was about 40, 45 percent. And, um, but this is the one that I'm showing you because it was kind of sad. This was in Wyoming. It was our site eclipse six. And you'll notice during the eclipse, we have no data. This system worked perfectly before and after every time except when we really needed it. And I, to me it was too clean to, to I, I mean I couldn't excuse, uh, explain it until I started talking to my observer and it turned out there were some big trucks that had parked near there and I don't know if people are aware but truck, trucking companies use GPS to track their truckings, their trucks. <clears throat> and we figure that the trucker had a jammer, a GPS jammer that he turned on so that his company wouldn't know that he had stopped to look at the eclipse. And he had probably parked. I mean, I showed this to somebody who knows more about jamming than I did, and he said that that jammer had to be pretty close. You know, I mean, you really were all of your systems were knocked out, I mean, all of your satellites. So we actually think the truck parked like with really close to where we were. And I hadn't even thought of it. I had not even thought to warn. Uh, and we weren't monitoring this. So we think that's what happened. So be aware, always take more data than you think you're gonna need and realize things can happen that you don't, don't expect. <laughs> So again, this is just some of the changes we did when we actually used all of the, the, glo the, the GPS receivers we had available across the US. And you can see this is the difference between the day before and the current day. And this is again, another sort of percent difference that you can show. But it, it, was, pre it was definitely significant. So I'm going to end this now talking a little bit about stratospheric warming. And the reason I'm saying you guys should all care about this, if you look, this is what happened this year. Right now, the polar vortex fractured and the eastern U.S. faces a punishing stretch of winter weather, which we know is out there. It's probably due to this um, polar vortex changing, or what's called stratospheric warming. And one of our scientists at Haystack has been really involved with this. Basically what happens in, in the polar region at about 30 kilometers, almost overnight the temperature goes from a winter to a summer temperature. In certain cases, in this case here, I think it went up by 50 Kelvin within one day. That's, that was in, kind of the maximum. Normally it's more like 30, but basically you get, you get the polar vortex switching from a winter to summer kind of conditions. And when that happens, the polar air comes down lower. So you get warmer temperatures in the Arctic and you get, can get really cold temperatures into the eastern or into Siberia or London. And I think I have some later sh uh, slides showing you Paris and London with snow. But um, we've been having them pretty frequently and it's probably related to um, global warming, but it's not definite. But basically this is just showing you during stratospheric warming again. This is at still at 10 hectopascal, so I never know. I think that's about 30 kilometers. I'm not a stratospheric person, but basically you can see we have the, the, the split vortex, whereas after strat warming, 
we really don't. It sort of has become one. And what we did notice is that, and we never expected this, uh, not only do you see this in the ionosphere over millstone, we actually see it a very strong signature in the ionosphere over the equatorial region. And that's using our GPS data. And basically what we see here or show here is that um, before the warming, the TEC is really only about 10 to 20 percent from the mean and everything looks normal. After the stratospheric warming, basically you're getting these huge increases in TEC in the morning and huge decreases in the <coughs> TEC in the afternoon. So indicating that you've really changed the wind patterns and you've had some global uh, changes. And basically this is, oh sorry, this is the average drift, is this black. And this is basically the, the drift that you're seeing. Um, at Hickamarca during, or in the equator, this is Hickamarca, this is what you're seeing uh, during the strat warm. So we're seeing these increases in the drift going upwards in the morning, and that's related to this, and a decrease in the afternoon. And again, the important point here is that something that's happening in the polar region is actually affecting the whole circulation of the planet to the extent that we're seeing it at the equator. And we now even have indications that we see it all the way in the, the polar, re in the Antarctic. So we're seeing changes, global changes, due, due to this large stratospheric warming. And again, this is giving you more, more history about the, the stratospheric warming and the, this is the main thing I wanted to say. There is, appears to be a relationship between all of these strat warms. I'm seeing it in the ionosphere, but it has to do with these really unusual cold snaps that we're having. And in January 2009, there was this huge cold snap over the U.S. and London got, tw London got 20 centimeters of snow, Paris is snow covered, and they think that it was all related. Uh, I was, I think in 2010, well, I can't remember what year, there was one year where we had snow, 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 was that two or three years ago? I, you, MIT was closed twice. Do you remember that? Anyway, right before that, that was preceded by a strat warm. So I knew, I was telling everybody, we're gonna have some cold weather a few weeks ago, and I think, I think that's related to what we're seeing. So uh, basically uh, what I want you to leave with here is that space weather can cause these dramatic changes. This is just a, um, uh, showing you some of the severe gradients that can happen. And there's a lot we can do to predict, but I think I've summarized all the important space weather changes that I deal with. Um, fairly significantly. And as I said, I, I think everybody should keep their ears open about radiation <clears throat> changes to our, the people we're sending off to Mars. I think we should pay attention to some of the radiation hazards they can have. So that, I think, is the end. Are there any questions? Yes? Ah, uh, well, I kind of skipped over that because I'm not really a stratospheric person. I don't think they really fully are aware of what's happening. It's, there are these things called planetary waves, large, large-scale waves that seem to be getting excited. And they could be interacting. I mean, it could be to do with the heat dissipation that they're, you know, the oceans are uh, warmer than they normally are. Nobody quite knows why these larger scale waves are being excited and then they're interacting with the tides. How they actually then interact and cause the, <coughs> the stratos stratospheric warming event is still research in progress as far as I know. It has to do with planetary waves. 
being excited and large scale ones. And is it man made? Possibly. Possibly related. I didn't understand those are you say planetary waves in what medium? Or between where and where? Those are tropospheric waves. Planetary waves. That's what I'm saying. I'm not really the expert. I think somebody from EAPS would probably be, or people that are studying them. I'm more, I can tell you more what happens in the ionosphere following these, uh, you know, how many days does it take once you have a stratospheric warming event for us to see it? We don't see it immediately. It takes a few, almost a week before we see these signatures in the equator but we see them consistently. So we think that there's, what's ever happening in, in the stratosphere is actually gradually um, sort of changing sort of the global circulation patterns so that we see it at the higher. I mean, stratosphere's at 30 kilometers and there's the mesosphere. We don't really know the interaction there and then there's the ionosphere. So the ionosphere is, several kilometers above and then I'm telling you I see something at the equator so you know th these are large scale events okay so you mentioned the um, 1860s um, storm um, I've heard a lot about like people worrying about one of these happening again, also not just affecting satellites, but power grids and stuff like that. <coughs> power grids are really, uh, the reason they're scared about that, and I think that was the 1989 storm we had, where a lot of Canada went down. And that's because when you can have a geomagnetic storm, you have these large fluctuations in the geomagnetic fields at the surface. And so the power grids will pick up on those and then they will get to the transformers and unless they turn those tra and unless they turned them off that fluctuation is more than they can handle so what people are really concerned is that it'll happen they won't have warning and they won't turn off they won't be able to turn off the transformers fast enough to ride through it and it could actually cost billions of dollars. I mean, they were saying to actually re rebuild these transformers, the electrical grid, is months. And so if you, if you blew out many of these, and it would be more high latitudes than lower latitudes because of, of the fluctuations of more related to higher latitudes, it, it could still, like, can you imagine New York without power for six months? I mean, that's the kind of scenario they're looking at. So that's why they're very concerned. And it's called GIC, which is Global Induced Current. Geomagnetically, Geomagne induced. Geomagnetically induced current. Just from the large fluctuations. And I skipped over that. <laughs> It does. It varies as a function of frequency and it varies as a function of location. So is it more severe at lower frequencies or, or higher frequencies? Or? Anything to do with the ionosphere is more severe at lower frequencies. So uh, when I say L band, I would say magnify everything by a factor of 10 or 100 as you go down to VHF and HF. So it's much more severe at lower. And um, do people are use um, signals from other satellites to sort of estimate the um, like electron density? You mean TEC? Well, all of the GNSS satellites we use. So, no, we, no comms, no so you need the two frequencies. And so there are, there are these beacons on satellites like there's, and I always mispronounce it. I want to say Cassiope, but I think it's Cassiopeia. But anyway, they have, they have this beacon which transmits UHF, uh, 
400, and I think there's an L band also, like 1100 megahertz. So if you were, so those are being transmitted by the satellite. If you've got a receiver on the ground, you can back out the TEC. There are not many of those satellites. I think one of the DMSPs also has that. So if the satellite is broadcasting at two frequencies and you can track that signal, you can also use it. But they need to be like separated enough to have the different dispersions. Yeah, you do need you do need a certain separation. Yeah. Those are typically, as I said, 150, 400, and 11 something. They're a multiplier of, I, I, I just, I don't know the number right off hand. And I, I, yeah, go ahead. Is there a strong need for more beacons like that or? Uh, we would love more like beacons. <laughs> no, I would love, I would love more beacons. We actually took a, a beacon receiver that, that Frank Lind, he's actually come and talk, talked here. So we took one of his receivers to Hickamarca and one of our problems was there weren't enough satellites to track with those beacons. So, so yes, we would love to have more. Um, but we're probably more set up for the GPS and GNSS ones. We would love to have more of those as well. And we would love to have more of those in space on satellites. So we'll take whatever we can get. So now I'm a little curious also, has anyone tried to like use EME reflections for this? Because it seems like you don't actually need that much power to get back enough of a return signal to at least do like timing for it. And that, those distances are pretty well known. Uh, I guess we do some of, you mean like, like reflectometry? Yeah. So we do that to measure the surface roughness of the water and the depth of the water. They're doing, those kind of experiments are ongoing. I'm not involved with them, but they use GPS sort of reflectometry measurements to, to measure sea surface height and roughness. I was also sort of thinking of like um, one of the typical things that's been kind of going on L band is like lunar reflections, which uh, seems like you've got all the parameters. Yeah, I think it just takes a lot of power to do. I mean, that would work fine if that makes sense. Yes, but you have to do it at two frequencies to get TEC. <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah, you mentioned that the. Uh, disturbing effects of the uh, uh, ionosphere um, get worse as the frequency goes down. Is this apply going all the way down to like you know, um, you know, the AM broadcast band like a like a megahertz, or even down to the um, long wave bands? Um, uh, the answer is yeah. It, I mean, it, it all goes back to that equation, the Appleton R tree. So yeah, it absolutely gets worse for all. I have to go back to that equation. So it continues to get worse as the as the wavelength gets longer, going yes. all the way down to long wave. Yes, hmm. and it's based on this. Whoa, sorry, I'm there. But if you look at it, this hmm. the the index of refraction. Well, I think you could probably see it here uh, as this frequency gets lower, this gets small, it, this is why. Am I, am I, have I, the answer is yes. <laughs> and I came in a little later, what is it, omega n? Uh, that's words? what's called the plasma frequency and it's defined here. So basically it's the function of the electrons. Uh, uh, I think that the easiest way is to say the plasma frequency is proportional to the square of the electron density, local electron density, okay? And so electron density is changing as a function of altitude and that, and there's a constant involved, but basically if this ratio here between the higher the frequency, the smaller this ratio, 
and the lower the frequency, the larger this ratio. And so that, in effect, affects your what's happening with your index of refraction. So your index of refraction, the closer it is to one, the more it acts like the speed of light. The further it is away from one, the, the, the more effects you're going to see. So that's, that's just a simple way of looking at this. Yeah. So probably everybody's overwhelmed. <laughs> well, I would say radio science is actually a great field to go into. And probably in my retirement, I will become a ham. But I probably have to wait till then. Well, we have licensed sessions <clears throat> here. Yep. They also have them in Nashua, which is closer. Oh. I actually know the clubs down there. So I, I recommend it to all of you. But definitely come visit us out at the site and, and get the radio club to arrange a trip. Right? We, we're planning on it. Um, with everything else, this IAP is sort of on hold until we have time. Yeah. I under, believe me, I understand that. But it's, it's nice to come out there and see. It's impressive. MIT, I mean, you are MIT. It is MIT. you all for coming, I guess, um, and thank you. Um, oh, thanks. For those of the, you watching online and for those of you here, there will be one more lecture on Wednesday. Dr. Joel Dawson is going to be here. He's done a lot of work with Nokia and also basically developed a lot of the sort of base station technology related to current cellular networks and is also going to talk about 5G. And radio license exams will also be Wednesday evening if anyone's interested. So, come back for that. And thank you. Well, Resi, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you were here. It's good to see you my place. <laughs> Interesting part, thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm glad.